You should see the view from up here. <laughs> it's a little crowded in here today. There's beautiful flowers all around us, it seems, in every direction. There's this gorgeous artwork on our walls that many of you young people created in Sunday school and catechesis. Thank you so much. And of course, there's all of us, some of us in our colorful clothes and hats. It's kind of like an explosion of joy for Easter. I'm not sure we could fit anything else in this room if we tried. But did you know that all of this stuff, everything we can see and touch, even if you count all of the nitrogen and oxygen and carbon dioxide molecules in the air, all of it only makes up about 20% of all of the matter that is in this room right now. How could that be? Physicists, at least the ones who write for a general audience, which are the only ones I can read, <laughs> call all of this stuff luminous matter because it reflects light so our eyes can see it. But it turns out that alongside all this luminous matter, this stuff that we can observe directly, there is five times as much other stuff, other matter, here, in this room, right among us. And not just in this room, but throughout the entire universe. Scientists call it dark matter because it doesn't reflect light. You can't see it. You can't feel it. In fact, you can't even observe it directly at all, even if you had, like, night vision goggles or something. Even if you were the most amazing scientist in the whole world with the best equipment, there would still be no way to observe this dark matter directly. Nonetheless, scientists are convinced that it exists, even though no one has ever seen it. What about you? Do you believe me? Or does this seem to you like nonsense? Like, perhaps, an idle tale? So here's the thing. The real reason why physicists have come to generally accept that dark matter is real, even though no one's ever seen it, is because of what they can see. What they can observe is that luminous matter, all of the stuff that they can observe, behaves in ways that can't be explained in any other way. There must be some kind of force acting upon everything in the universe to make it behave in exactly the way that it does. And they've just given the name dark matter to whatever it is causing these other forces. They know they are real, even though no one has ever seen it. Now, I share this with you not because I missed my calling to become a physicist. Trust me, I didn't. But rather because it helped me earlier in my adult life to more fully embrace Jesus' resurrection as a core part of my spiritual identity, as something more than just an idle tale. Each year on Easter Sunday, we read a different gospel's direct account of Jesus' resurrection. While they all describe the tomb being empty, the details of when and where the risen Christ appears and what he's like when he does come back vary widely. In one gospel, he's in Galilee, and he's pretty human. He's cooking fish, he's talking with his disciples. In another one, though, he's only in Jerusalem, and he appears, and then he disappears, and then he reappears again somewhere else, like some kind of spirit. And in one gospel, the risen Christ doesn't even appear at all. How could these accounts, supposedly direct observation, all really be true? The Gospels were written several years, several decades after Jesus' rising. What if these writers hadn't actually seen the risen Christ themselves, but instead had come to be convinced that he had come back to life, and then they had gone back to write accounts of his Easter appearances based on their belief? In fact, we know that that's exactly how Mark's Gospel was written. Could it also be true of Matthew and Luke and John? In 
In an odd way, learning about dark matter helped me to become more accepting of that possibility. And here's why. Because it reminds me that something no one has ever seen directly might still be real and true, might still be a real part of this creation. Like the confidence of physicists that dark matter exists, we can have confidence in Christ's rising, not because we have direct observations of it, but by noticing the changes in the things we can see and observe in this world that cannot be explained any other way. Even if the direct testimonies of Jesus' resurrection were not, in fact, eyewitness accounts, they were far from idle tales. You see, when Jesus died on the cross, it called into question the divine origin of everything that his presence on earth embodied. Compassion, self-giving love, generosity of spirit and forgiveness, reconciliation and justice. Jesus' life embodied among us the purest expression of these holy and divine values. And when he was arrested and tried and executed by his enemies and betrayed, denied, and abandoned by his friends, it looked as though the world's source of love and hope had finally lost out for good to the forces of fear, violence, and aggression, that they would get the last word. The resurrection is the ultimate victory of divine love over the human will to violence. The empty tomb is God's way of saying that the movement of love and compassion among humanity can never be destroyed, not even by the most brutal opposition. And that's because these values are not just good, they're divine, they're eternal, and they can never be obliterated from the universe. And that is the Easter miracle. That is at the heart of what we mean when we proclaim the Lord is risen indeed. And the real proof of this miracle is not found in the Bible. Its effects are found all around us, in our communities, in our families, and in the world, in history, and in the present, and with God's help in the future. In every place that the power of love and compassion returns and remains, even in the face of the cruelty and aggression that the world likes to dish out to each of us, sometimes in very unequal measure. We can see the proof in the world's outpouring of support and solidarity to people and communities victimized by terrorism in Brussels and Ankara and Paris and around the world. This solidarity is rooted in empathy and compassion and taking a stand against violence. We can see the proof in the face of a 20-year-old nursing student in Haiti who puts on her uniform each day and commits to bettering herself in her and her country by getting an education, despite all the odds against her. 300 years of colonial oppression, unbelievable political corruption, and the worsening effects of poverty and hunger even six years after a devastating earthquake. We see the proof in a transformed spirit right here in Bedford after our four-year experience of coming to know and host homeless families in our schools and in our stores and in our neighborhoods, where initial responses of uncertainty and fear, even aggression, got crowded out by our community's commitment to relationship and care and generosity. We see the proof in the grace in our families when cycles of addiction are broken by the decision to seek treatment, find healing and wholeness and reconciliation where there has been harm. We see it in those moments when our own hearts somehow become freed from the pessimism and hostility and self-pity that builds up in us and we recover our commitment to being creatures of gentleness in a world that is too accustomed to aggression. What about you? 
Where can you see the presence of the risen Christ at work in your own life this Easter? How much evidence have you collected? How true is Jesus' rising for you? Perhaps Jesus is rising, a story written to describe what those early writers knew to be true, that God's love cannot be conquered, even by the most violent and powerful forces of human evil. That when it comes to the history of God's presence in this world, there will always be another chapter still to write. I don't know how Jesus rose that first Easter morning, but I can say with confidence that Jesus' is rising is not an idle tale, and neither is the risen life he offers to each one of us. The evidence of his rising is all around us, and with God's help, our lives too can become more proof that whatever darkness we may know, God's love never dies. Hallelujah. Amen. <laughs>